Well, it was not the New Year's celebration that we were looking for as the Raiders fall on the road to the Indianapolis Colts, 23-20. to Eddie Pascal hanging out with my guy, Jason Fitz, in the fifth quarter presented by Twitch. Uh, and Fitz, you and I were talking before we started rolling. Really a game that kind of felt appropriate, kind of felt fair, kind of felt like a fitting wrap-up to the Raiders' postseason hopes and dreams in 2023, did it not? I, I feel like a couple of weeks ago we said – it's amazing how an entire season comes down to a handful of plays, you know, and this game was that a handful of plays was everything as well as this defense has played over the last month of the season. A couple of miscommunications on the back end, create huge plays that lead to points. And, you know, you, you look at those, a couple of key penalties at the wrong time, like small mistakes in a game in a, in a league right now, where there's just so little differentiation between the good and the bad, like the Colts are sitting on the precipice of the playoffs, right? And the difference in this game and for both of these teams was who made more mistakes in key moments. And the answer to that, unfortunately, today was the Raiders. The the penalties, the the miscommunication on the back end of the defense, and the offense couldn't get it rolling. Like there's a lot of little things that, you know, this is the sort of game that seven, eight months from now, when we're sitting there on Raider Nation radio, it'll be like, yeah, but if the Vikings game had gone different and what happened against the Bears, and oh my God, if there isn't pass interference late in the game against the Colts, right? Like it's just it's going to happen. This is this is one that's going to haunt us all offseason. Yeah, I think what's tough, Fitz, too, is that I think we, while we saw a lot of the familiar kind of thorns uh, in the side of the Raiders this year, we talk about kind of the struggles to be consistent offensively. We talk about some of the explosive plays the defense surrendered. I, I think for me, the most disappointing part of it was, obviously, you're in a position to keep your playoff hopes alive, week 17, on the road. The, all the parallels to 2021 we, we all talked about last week. But it was the penalties. It was the fact that you and I have not had to sit here and yell about the penalties in like, what, two, two and a half months? And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, biggest game of the year, you need to play a clean football game on the road against, candidly, an Indianapolis Colts team that is not a, a world-beating type team. You just got to play good, solid football against them. And time and time again, it felt, Fitz, it felt like we were watching the Raiders of yesteryear with all the yellow, uh, yellow flags out there this afternoon. Well, and so many of them self-inflicted. Yes, like yes. you know, I, and and look, I don't want to pile on to any individual, but a couple of the the false starts for Illuminor early on, three false starts in the first half. Uh, Jack Jones with the offsides on the missed field goal that could have changed the entire end of this game. I I won't fault the pass interference one as much. I think that's an aggressive play. And you and I've talked about Jack a few times. Like you get, that's what you want. Like that's, you brought him in to be aggressive and make big plays. So I, that one, I don't fault, but lining up offsides. Yeah. I mean, those sorts of things of false starts. I, I, that's, those are the inexcusable shooting yourself in the foot. Like that's not a effort play. That's a mental error. And it's like unforced errors in tennis. You just can't get past them. And I think the one, I mean, just sticking on the field goal real quick, Fitz, I think that that offsides to me was confused. I mean, obviously, you don't want to have an offsides at any point in the game, especially on fourth down. But, like, that was a 50-yard field goal. This is this wasn't a 33-yard chip shot. And so, I like, I understand the effort and wanting to be there and wanting to disrupt the kick. But this is not, you know, you know, lining up from 31 straight down the middle. That's a hard, that's a long distance big dog kick. Uh, and unfortunately, the, uh, the Colts get a second crack at that. But, you know, I, I think Fitz... I was thinking about today, right? And obviously we'll have a lot of time to kind of dissect what went wrong with this. But to me, it felt like kind of the same story we've been telling for, I mean, not all year, but most of the year. The defense did just enough, just enough to keep you in this game. But the inconsistencies along the offense, uh, you know, you struggled. You look at the day today, you know, only 84 yards on the ground. Zamir goes 20 for 71. But it was the, you have a nice drive. And then you go dormant for three, four, or five drives. And, and I guess I still don't understand, Fitz, what the issue is in doing what we've seen the Raiders do when they're successful, doing that consistently. I think that speaks to something they mentioned on the broadcast that they really loved about Shane Steichen, uh, the head coach of the Colts, when they said as a play caller, he's not afraid to call the same thing over and over again if it's working. I, I hated part of this game plan. I'm just going to be honest, man. Like the fact that they said in the first half at one point, I don't remember what the exact number was, but they said, you know, on Monday night, Aiden O'Connell had threw 21 times. He's already eclipsed that number. That made no sense to me because Zamir, the yardage on Zamir was, was fine. It was fine. The commitment to Zamir wasn't there. I, yeah. I, I felt like there was a real opportunity to come in and say, we're going to run the ball. It's, it shocked me that early on it was like, well, let's get Aiden in a rhythm. Like that's not, 
I, I know the back end of this defense for the Colts has been susceptible. I don't think that that was a plan to win this football game. It made no sense to me. And then even, you know, Antonio Pierce addressed it at halftime, saying you wanted to be more committed to the run. Uh, of course, we all wanted that. Like, I, I just thought that was one of the biggest surprises in this game. I, I The game plan really surprised me. I, I feel like, Fitz, some of that has to be like, feel like you're kind of overcorrecting from last week, right? Where obviously Aiden doesn't uh, doesn't complete a pass outside of the first quarter. Like, do you think some of that is, hey, we got to get the young fellow's confidence going. We got to put him in rhythm a little bit. So maybe he can be a little more explosive, dynamic, whatever word you want to use in the passing attack. I think that's part of it. And and look, the one long drive near the end of the first half for the Colts uh, might've been the second half uh, when they started with the quick pass outside. Same thing. Like sometimes you're just trying to get the defense to, to loosen up a little bit, to create running opportunities. That's fine. I, I understand that from a strategy, from a strategic point, from a strategy standpoint, I understand it. Uh, I, I just thought overall, because you didn't have that commitment to the run, drives just stalled. I, I, I text you this, peel behind the curtain, at the end of the first half. Imagine what a difference 10 yeah. yards in this game would have made because the Raiders kept stalling at the 45. When you have one of the best deep kickers in the NFL, all you have to do is get inside the 40 and you're in field goal range. The number of times they got to the 43, the 45, and they just couldn't get four or five yards to even make it a strong, like would have taken a lot to get the kick, but I trust the special teams of the Raiders. They just didn't even have the chance. Like Daniel Carlson didn't even have the chance to come out and do his job for the most part. Like that's the difference when you don't establish the run that that extra four or five yards, a drive, was the difference in nine points in this game. Yeah, and I think some of it too, Fitz, is we talk about some of these the things today that were a little confusing that we haven't seen. We talk about the penalties, but like the inability to be effective on third and fourth and short was was pretty mind-boggling to me today. Pretty confusing. And yes, I know you don't have Josh Jacobs and, and like you have Zamir and kind of this patchwork offensive line. Colton Miller has to come in uh, and you know really play hero, right? There Munford goes down and and Colton who is very clearly not 100% slides back into left tackle, but that to me fits is something that I feel like we haven't seen a lot of is that indecision, that, that confusion on third and fourth down, some of the deep shots on third and one to then not go for it on foot. Like that to me just didn't really equate this afternoon in Indy. Yeah, that's one of the, I think if we have a, a criticism of the identity uh, over the last month, I still can't tell if this is a conservative or aggressive team in down and distance situations. I don't know. Like the fact that you don't go for it on fourth and, and a yard and a half repeatedly, but then somehow your special teams are out on the field. You bring them back so that you can go for it on fourth and 10 and you barely get the play call off because yeah. nobody knew what the hell you were doing. Like, I, I think those are the moments where uh, you understand the identity uh, they they sent the they showed the stat that the Colts go for it on fourth down whatever fourth most in the NFL like you know the Eagles identity you know the Colts identity you know the Chiefs identity like you know how these teams handle fourth down I still don't know what the plan is under Antonio Pierce in this offense particularly on fourth down like I'm I'm confused because sometimes they use timeouts sometimes they don't sometimes they seem to be aggressive with the play calling sometimes they're not and that's stuff that that now you've got to see get figured out. I mean, we're not two weeks into this regime. We're we're a half a season into this regime. Yeah, and I think to your point, Fitz, it, it feels like it's a fluid, ever evolving kind of kind of thing, right? Because I feel like early on in the Antonio Pierce era, you know, like you look at those two games against the New York teams, very aggressive, going for it on fourth down, not even thinking about it, saying, no, 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 Aiden, stay out there, do your thing. But now we're at a point, and, and certainly I think some of that is we've got a bigger sample size of Aiden O'Connell. You're certainly down Josh Jacobs. We talk about the moving line, uh, moving pieces along the, along the offensive line. But but I'm with you. It, it feels like there hasn't been consistency in that regard. There hasn't been consistency in who the Raiders are, what they want to be. We hear it, we hear it, we hear it. We want to run the ball. We look at it statistically when the Raiders are at their best, when they have been at their best in 2023, it's when they run the football with whether it's Zamir, Josh, Brandon Bolden, whoever it may be. But I, but I think today, yeah, we kind of revert back to the, okay, it felt frantic. I don't know if is that the right word, Fitz, but it yeah. felt a little discombobulated compared to weeks past. Yeah, uh, it, it did feel frantic. And... Go back to, to Aiden for a second. What's the go-to route? What's the go-to thing? Mm -hmm. that, that's like as, as I was watching, you know, multiple TV set up, humble brag, but as I was watching, you know, the even the Cardinals go up against the Eagles and probably the biggest stunner so far of the, uh, of the NFL Sunday, there were times where you saw Kyler Murray drop back and he knew exactly where he was going with the football and he was going to, he's going to get it in there. And he did. I watched 
as the, at the same time, there were a couple of times that Hunter Renfro was in motion and I was like, Oh yeah, Hunter Renfro is still on this football team. Like, I just don't, I don't know when you, when you're third and six and you need a completion, I don't know what the go-to route is. I, I know that Aiden's going to find a way to get Devonte involved, but you know, a couple of times he was late uh, and low trying to get the ball to Jacoby Myers. It just doesn't feel like the passing offense has any identif- identity on what, what they're trying to accomplish. And I think you feel that from the coaches when it comes to some of what they're calling. Like there's this, there's a nice little out about 15 yards down the field to Devonte. Aiden likes that throws that well, we know that the rest of it. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, here's an interesting little nugget for you, Fitz. We look at the target totals uh, from this afternoon in Indy. Devontae Adams, 21 targets. Jacoby Myers, 10 targets. Then after that, who's your next receiver that has a target? You have one receiver. Trey Tucker had five targets today. Those are your three. Devontae with 21, Jacoby with 10, Trey Tucker with five. And look, we talk about Hunter getting involved. Certainly, Hunter did not do anything today, right? Had not a single target. But I I think... It, it felt like today, Fitz, we were kind of towing that line of making sure Devontae got his touches, making sure Devontae got his shots up, uh, while also maybe being a little too committed to the... I don't know. It was tough. We talk about it not making sense. We talk about it being frantic. We talk about it being a little all over the place. I think you look at the numbers, and that kind of bears it out a little. Yeah, I think it's just a reminder that the more we see a quarterback the more the rest of the league yeah. sees a quarterback and the more the rest of a league sees a quarterback. That's why I, I love to always tell people this doesn't work well for sports talk radio, which, you know, I have a long past in, but like three years, like it, when you, if you really want to know if you've got a really good quarterback, I think like uh, you can tell in one year, like we might have the guy in year two league adjust to the guy. You got to see the guy break through year three is really the year where I'm like, yeah, you got the guy, right? Like I I think it it takes so long because defenses get smarter. And what do we see here? I mean, Gus Bradley obviously had a defensive game plan. He felt comfortable with. There were a couple of times they threw a blitz at the Raiders. The Raiders didn't seem ready for it. Not just Aiden, but sometimes Amir Abdullah with uh, a a bad uh, blitz pickup late in the second half. Like there's just little things that, you know, across the board, this offense lacks the juice, even though they have a ton of weapons. And even though the offensive line has played better, they lack the juice to be able to just go out and go blow to blow with with teams that can score. So that means the defense has to be flawless. And obviously, in the first half, you could see that the defense was not going to be flawless today. Yeah. And, and I think, oh, gosh, you bring up so many good points, Fitz. But I, I think the hard part about a game like today is you had to, if you're a fan of this team, right, give Patrick Graham all the credit in the world. His defense has exceeded expectations tenfold in 2023. But you you had to feel like there was a game where, I don't want to say they came back to earth, but they looked mortal, right? And this was that game. And we knew coming into the game, we talked to all of our people who work for the Colts, who cover the Colts, and they said, yeah, the explosive play, that's what you got to watch out for the Colts. Yeah, Jonathan Taylor's going to do his thing, and he's going to be ex- explosive, and you know, he, all he's done is, is find the, uh, the end zone the past month since he's come back. But it, it's really the explosive plays. And what ended up biting the Raiders today? The explosive play, Minshew operating off script, right? Giving, holding out for just a beat more to give his guys an opportunity to go do their thing. And I think a lot of those, we see them on third down and they're just backbreakers. But we haven't seen that a lot in 2023. But today, there is your, uh, there is your kind of thorn in the side, Jason Fitz. By the way, a reminder of the value of a mobile quarterback. Yes, sir. Right? Like, because, and heck, we saw this last night. You know, there was a play for the Lions against uh, the Cowboys where it looked like the Lions were about to get a safety and uh, Dak was just mobile enough to get around him. And then all of a sudden it turns into a 92 yard touchdown like that. We saw Gardner Minshew climb the pocket really well in this game yeah. and that that long third down completion. Uh, a, a game of inches, right? No, no different than later in the game. Epps is in perfect position on. I think it was a fourth down uh, against Pittman. Perfect position to knock the ball down and just can't quite get there. Like you have a mobile quarterback that stretches things and then accurate as he's climbing the pocket, it requires a different level of defensive sort of ability and a little bit of luck. And uh, the Raiders didn't have any of that and, today. And I don't know if this makes us feel better or worse about today's uh, today's outing fits, but I, I feel like you watch that 60 minutes and the Colts were the better football team. Uh, I feel like they were able to control the line of scrimmage more. Minshew had a little a little more magic in that satchel of his than Aiden O'Connell had this afternoon. But there they were at the very end, Fitz. The Raiders are in position to at least make things super interesting 
And, and it makes you think. We talk about the Vikings game. We talk about that Bears game. 2023, and unfortunately, it feels like this could buy, kind of be our, our soundbite for multiple Ra- Raider seasons as of past, or New Year's past. But you think back to these little moments and what could have, should have, possibly, maybe, could have been, and it just hurts, man. Like, obviously, the Raiders officially eliminated from postseason contention uh, with this afternoon's loss against the Colts. But it, they were right there. And we talk about it being a microcosm fits. The 2023 Raiders, there were so many moments where they were right there, but just couldn't get over the hump for whatever reason. We've talked before about uh, the fan base that you and I both love, a big part of why both of us have our jobs in life. Um, and that fan base is, at times, uh, passionate and critical of the way the team is covered. What I think is funny to me, uh, and, and I'll toot my own horn for a second, coming into the season, I was asked to predict a win total uh, by several outlets, and my prediction was eight. Eight and nine was yeah. my predictive finish, uh, which is, I think, still, obviously, in the cards, I think Denver's a beatable football team. So eight and nine, uh, not what anybody wants, but also I went into last year's draft saying, all right, two-year rebuild. You know, So the hard part about some of this is that the Raiders as an organization right now, not only have to figure out what, what the coach and GM situation looks like, we know that. And maybe Antonio Pierce and Champ Kelly have done enough to, to keep the job. That's a, a constant conversation. I'm asked on every radio interview I do. Have they done enough? I, I will say this. There's also a, are the young guys developing, right? Like that's the other part of this. The reason that for me, the sky's not falling. The reason that for me, this isn't where we were last year is last year. I looked around and thought, man, there's just a lot of holes on this roster. Mm-hmm. This year, I look at it and say, yeah, there's some things to address in the offseason. I just don't, I don't think that this team is far off. Like, I I think, and again, not throwing any shade at any one person, I think that there's going to be a different quarterback for the Raiders next year, and that's going to make a big difference in this. But I think there are fundamental pieces across this roster that I didn't feel like were there a year ago. So, you know, I, I, I want it just stress that we go through this feeling every year. Well, we've been eliminated from the playoffs. I I actually think this team reminds me a lot of the year that we snuck into the playoffs. Like there are good things here that I think can be built around. Whatever they decide is going to happen next. I think young guys have played well enough to show that there's something to be hopeful about with the organization. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, we look at Zamir White, Zamir, the Zamir's past couple of weeks, we look at Thayer Munford doing a really nice job at left tackle, kind of since he's been thrown in there. Uh, we look at the development of a guy like Trey Tucker, certainly a lot more to go there. We look at Malcolm Kuntz now in year three, being resurgent, being reborn. You know, so we definitely look at the cupboard and it's certainly not bare. But I, I think that if you're a fan of this team, Fitz, I think the natural point as we sit here on New Year's Eve, I almost forgot that for a sec, as we sit here on, on New Year's Eve and kind of do our post-mortem uh, on what happened to 2023 Las Vegas Raiders. I think to me, most fans will probably come back to the fact that you look at this offense with Josh Jacobs, with Hunter Renfro, with Devontae Adams, with with a Michael Mayer, who I think has been really, really good for parts of 2023, and you weren't able to get anything uh, consistent on that side of the football. And I think to me, if you're a fan, that's probably the part of this year where you go, huh, I don't know how much that adds up to me. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, yeah. As, as a lifelong diehard, you know, uh, sitting across from you right now, it's exactly what my mind says. If, if yeah. we had gone back to the, to June and said, hey, by the way, the offense is essentially going to be worth about 16 points a game, 17 points a game, you know, with one big outlier, this offense is just going to stink for a lot of the year. But the defense, man, is going to be, I, I gen- never would have believed this. Like, never would have believed like, this. This is a playoff cal. This is a Super Bowl caliber defense, the way they're playing right now. They force turnovers, they get after the, the passer. Like, this is a Super Bowl. You you watch what what the Dolphins had happened to him today. Like watch if you watch the way most of these teams in the AFC are playing defense. I, I, I'm stunned at how good this Raiders defense has become this year. I I hope you can bottle it up and sell it. But you're right. Like I think the fact that this this offense has been the shortcoming. That's the thing that kicks us all in the no no places. But I'll also say this about New Year's Eve particularly, and no fan wants to hear this, but I got to be real for a second. Like New Year's Day. Everybody goes to the gym, right? And everybody, like, there's a bunch of people. They're gonna, they're gonna cut carbs. Like, they're gonna go get gastric bypass. They're gonna go like, like, like lipo. Like, they're gonna get all these different procedures done, like air sculpting. You know, pay twenty grand to get like the 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 fat sucked out of you. They're gonna do all of these quick fix things. And then at the end of the year, when it's like, man, why have I not like, why am I not in better shape? Why did I not lose the the weight that I wanted to lose? Because quick fix doesn't work, right? And so I'm just saying through this process. 
that it is a process. Like, uh, the, I don't think this is a hot take. The Chiefs organization for the last five years has done things better than the Raiders organization. Ta-da, there we go. Hot take for you, right? Like, at some point, you got to look at the standard of the division and say, we want to be as good as that. And I just think that's a process. Now, you got to get the right people in charge. You got to have the right minds running everything. And you got to have the right talent. I, this is such an, an important moment because the Raiders could, the wheels could have fallen off. This could have been a top five draft pick team. And I know people would say, yes, that means we get a quarterback. And I would just remind everybody that like, okay, if you're picking in the top five, you're getting a quarterback and you're also probably getting a roster turner of roughly 48 people. So you better hope the new regime gets 48 people, right? Like I, I just think that where things ended, there's a lot to clean up. There's a lot to get better, but it's not as bad as people want it. Like our years of watching a team suck doesn't mean that this team sucks, if that makes sense. hundred percent. And I think what's important to kind of, to, you know, kind of carry on top of that fits is that to me, the biggest thing, and I know I've, to, I've said this to you a couple of times, but I, I, it kind of played out again today. Look, when towards the end of this game, when things were not going very well, what I'm a big, let's look at the body language kind of guy. And I, you look at that sideline, Antonio Pierce and his staff is building those guys up. How many shots did we see of Josh Jacobs today being the first guy dapping people up coming off the sideline, whether it be Zamir, the offensive line, Max Crosby, whoever it was? You have guys that are engaged in what's going on, right? It's very easy, to your point, to a month ago, six weeks ago, say, hey, this is a five-win team. Let's pack it up. Colton Miller, right? We talked about Colton earlier. Colton, clearly not 100%. Very clearly not 100%. And this is now two weeks in a row where he has put those pads on and said, you know what, I'm going to work, I'm putting on for my guys, and by and large, playing pretty well, doing the best he can. So I think the energy has been there, the buy-in has been there, the commitment to playing Raiders football has been there. Has it been perfect? Absolutely not. We look at some of the high moments, we look at a lot of the low moments, has not been perfect. But the buy-in, the commitment to doing it the right way has been there. And so to your point, right, is the cupboard bare? No, it's not. You need to add a few ingredients, maybe a little little filet mignon here or there. But like, all the same, if you're a fan of this team, there are certainly things to be excited about as we carry on into, you know, we cannot overstate how how pivotal of an offseason this is going to be for this organization. Uh, you mentioned Colton. I want to give a shout out because I was watching close. The first couple of plays he was in, he wasn't even using his arm. Yeah. Like he was just protecting that arm. Just and he guts, was still man. Out there. And, 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 you know, let's look across the league, no farther than the Chargers uh, to see a team that's absolutely quit, right? Like it's easy to quit. And it, look at the Panthers who at times this year have just looked like a team that's absolutely quit. And then you look at some of the other teams that have had nothing to play for, but have still come out like they give a damn. Like the, the Cardinals, who I mentioned earlier, yep. are a good example of that. Part of the reason that people like where Jonathan Gannon is taking that franchise is because this year, when there wasn't expected to be much to play for, they've played hard, right? Like, I just, I think there is something to what you're talking about there when you talk about the effort that we've seen from players. You talk about... They give a damn like I'm not willing today right now to say that Josh Jacobs won't be a part of the Raiders next year. We don't know. Yeah. We don't know what the new regime is going to bring in. What we do know is that at the, you're right. Like watching Josh Jacobs go up to Illuminor after the false start and see him encourage him, man, to me, that was like, I've asked a million times over the last four or five years, who's the dog in this locker room? Like who's the person that brings everybody together? There are answers to that this year. There are clear answers to who the guys are that run this sideline. And I'm, I just think that's got to be part of the future that you build on. 100%. And one guy who, you know, obviously doesn't didn't play today, but is the captain of keeping the vibes up is Jimmy G, right? Like we, the Jimmy G experiment, whatever you want to call it, we can dissect that until we're blue in the face. But one thing that is undebatable, he has been a phenomenal teammate every single second that he has worn the silver and black. A phenomenal 10 out of 10 teammate. Uh, and we talk about keeping the vibes up, and whether it's Josh when he's hurt, whether it's Jimmy, whoever it is, there is no disconnect in this locker room. This is a group of 53 guys in the practice squad who are all motivated, uh, trying to do the same thing, do it in the right way. Uh, and I think, like I said, if you're a fan, you have to feel good about that. But Fitz, we obviously will not go into the new year celebrating, ringing it in with the Raiders' victory, but all the same, we have one more game. We get one more opportunity to do this next Date TBD, right? Because we'll find out later tonight whether it's a Saturday or a Sunday to wrap up the regular season. What do we want to see when the Raiders do uh, kind of do this thing for the last time against Jarrett Stidham and the Denver Broncos, friend of the program, Jarrett Stidham? I think we have to acknowledge that next weekend will be the first weekend of the year where the Raiders truly have nothing to play for. 
So what do they look like mm. when there's nothing on the line? I think you'll get a real sense because uh, everybody can talk. Everybody all week can tell you how much they love AP and how much they love this staff. But the only thing that the Max Crosby's of the world have to play for next weekend, that the Colt Millers of the world have to play for next weekend, guys that are banged up, guys that are leaders, the only thing they have to play for is to show Mark Davis and the Raiders organization that they want this coaching staff to remain in place. So in my mind, you know, I, I know all the conversations about Antonio Pierce are, are real, but you have an opportunity to finish the season having beaten the Chiefs, the Chargers, and the Broncos. If you can beat your division rivals and win three of the last four on the way out the door, I think that's the, that's the best the players can do to make a case that AP, as he has said, you know, my resume is on the grass. Well, I, they got one more chance to put one more thing on that resume. I think that's significant. If they come in and mail it in, then I think it shows you that all of this was for naught, honestly. But if they come in and play like I think they can play, then it's going to keep those questions coming. Yeah, 100%. And look, I, I don't think that this team is going to pack it up by any stretch. I don't think that Max Crosby is going to let these guys kind of hang their head and, hey, let's limp to the finish line. Um, you know, I, I think we talk about those dogs. We talk about those team leaders. Like, I think they're going to keep everyone's head the right way, uh, you know, on the right way. And I think there's going to be a lot of fun. I think Allegiant will be electric next weekend, whether it's Saturday or Sunday. Also, I don't want to get on my high horse real quick. How, how do we live in a world where you and I are recording this at 2 o'clock on a Sunday and we don't know when the team is playing next week? Uh, a conversation for another day, Jason Fitz. A conversation for another day. But all the same, uh, Happy New Year to you. This has been so much fun. I'm glad we get one more opportunity to do it again at some point next weekend, question mark. Uh, and we hear, I heard you're going to be out here for the Super Bowl. We'll make sure we hang out then. But uh, on our way out, Fitz, you know the deal. Where can the people find you? Uh, thank you. Follow me on social media at Jason Fitz. Also, you can check out all my work on Yahoo Sports, doing a ton of reaction stuff out there that we love and some great podcast video on demand stuff that's out there for you, too. And uh, be sure to li listen on Fox Sports Radio. I'll actually be on FSR tomorrow for four hours hanging Ooh. out on New Year's Day. So, like, I'm doing four hours of Fox Sports Radio, but usually every Saturday. And uh, in all seriousness, uh, it, it, we say this every year we get to work together, but as the year comes to an end, Man, I'm so thankful that, like, we get this level of support from Raider Nation. Like, this team isn't always easy to root for, and it has not been an easy in my life. I'm 46, right? Like, I, I've been a lifelong diehard my entire life. It has not been an easy time. But somehow, some way, unlike other fan bases, man, the love and support that comes from Raider Nation through that, even in tough years like this, even on tough weekends like this, it's why we have jobs. It's why we love what we do. It's why we get to do what we do. So I always find myself at the end of the year incredibly thankful, not just that I'm a fan of the Raiders, but that the Raiders fans have embraced me so much. 100%. And look, let's not get too mushy, Fitz. We got one week left, all right? I'm not putting yeah. a bow. Yeah, I'm not, yeah, putting, a, right. yeah, I'm not, right. putting, I'm not mean, putting a bow on this season quite yet. We can do it all next week. I promise okay. you. We will we'll do all of our friendship. We'll do all of our everything that we got to do. But today... Bracelets? Will there be friendship bracelets? Yeah, we could do that. We could do that. I'm not very arts just, and crafty, but I, I was curious on the way out though since you're doing a big dog show tomorrow does that mean Fitz has a low-key new year's eve oh yeah, yeah yeah like my my idea of a, a spicy new year's eve is like i don't know i might be up at midnight that's it like i i, I might I, I don't know eddie you know like i spent my whole life yeah uh, working in the music business never had new year's can i tell you one quick new year's eve uh, story though i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna ruin a magic trick for everybody uh the year the band perry played uh dick clark's rock new year's eve uh, we were on the West Coast stage, right? So if you're watching the broadcast tonight, you'll see where they're like, let's throw to LA. And they always have a different host in LA and a different group of bands. What nobody knows is that the LA portion specifically is pre-recorded like a month in advance. Oh. So it's in this big warehouse and they put everybody out there for New Year's Eve. So the best part is because you're on TV live, in air quotes, you can't actually work on New Year's Eve because nice. you're doing Dick Clark. So, like, my favorite New Year's Eve was the one where I got to play Dick Clark's Rockin' New Year's Eve, but I got to sit on my ass on my couch and watch at midnight. And I was like, oh, this is my type of New Year's Eve. Like, <laughs> don't put me out in the masses. I want nothing to do with all of it. But also, we got to be on TV. Like, oh, that's, that's my favorite one. That's a W. That is a good New Year's Eve. Yeah, I'm not a huge, uh, I'm not a huge New Year's Eve guy. Only for the sense of, like, I, I can't stay up till midnight. I can't do it. You know, like you've got a, you've got a newborn. You're I up do. at midnight anyway. I, I was actually, in my, it's funny you bring that up. The uh, the wife and I were debating this morning, kind of in the fog of war. The baby woke up ever so briefly. Like he's, we're out of the darkness, knock on wood, of that stage. But uh, you know, every once in a while, he'll kind of he'll kind of stir, and we got to you know settle him down again. So it happened last night, and I thought it happened at 12:02 a.m. The wife thought it was at 1:30. 
a.m. Now, both of us, <laughs> both of us wear glasses, right? So yep. in, in the middle of the night when it's dark, we're kind of both looking at the uh, at the clock. But yeah, that was the big debate this morning. Is what time did the baby wake up? Was it twelve o two or was it one thirty two? We'll never know. We will. Never I also know. said newborn. Like uh, I said, newborn. How long am I? I don't think newborn doesn't qualify anymore. I'm, I'm not know. good at this. Like. I think I mean he's not even he's eight months, so I don't even know if that counts as I mean he's still a baby. Like he's he's definitely a baby. Did we say infant at this point? Like I think so. Is that that's probably no 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 toddler I know is two. Toddler is two plus. So we're not even close to that. But he's uh he's a baby. I just call him the baby. Yeah, the baby. baby. That's how it works. Well hopefully the baby sleeps. We all go through a healthy, happy new year's. Uh fits. A blast, per usual. A tough day at the office for the Silver and Black. Uh, as we said, Raiders fall in Indianapolis 23-20, to officially ending their postseason dreams, hopes, and aspirations for this season. But we'll do it all again at some point next weekend. Day TBD. Make sure you stay uh, locked into Raiders.com because as soon as we know, we will make sure that all of you out there know. So on that note, for Eddie Pascal, my guy Jason Fitz, everyone else at Silver and Black Productions, most importantly, everyone, stay safe tonight. Don't drink and drive. Make good decisions, and we will see you guys next week uh, for our final episode of the year of the fifth quarter presented by Twitch.